All right, so we're about to begin an interview with uh, Heather Bruce Vitch. Um, the interviewer, as usual, will be William McCray. It is uh, November 26, 2015, and we are in St. John's, Newfoundland. So uh, let's begin. So could you please state your full name? Heather Bruce Vitch. And could you please state your age? 56. And um, where were you born? St. John's, Newfoundland. Okay. So a local. Uh, and what did your parents do as a child? Uh, my dad was a sales rep, representative, manager of sales, and my mom was a homemaker for the most part, although she had a daycare in her latter years. Okay. And um, you as a child, what did you do to pass the time? What were your go-to activities? Um, I was a reader. Um, I was always involved in public speaking. And um, I was from a big family, so I'm one of seven. And uh, actually, in, when I was growing up, we didn't have as many organized activities. So really, with six brothers and sisters, um, you basically, I lived quite close to a park, and you played outdoors. Yeah. What did you read? Any, uh, when, I was, when I was a child, just a little bit of everything, yeah. I think. Yeah, just uh, typical kids' books. And did you, um, was there ever a point uh, as a child or at school um, when you were young that you, where you were interested for sciences or... Um, like that? No, in actual fact, I was always interested in languages, okay. and um, and so it's ironic that I would end up in, in a mining uh, career. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah. So um, what were your? I guess going into your senior years in high school, what, what were your favorite classes, best classes, and where were you thinking of going? French and English. Um, I really liked to write, so English was a was a favorite, and um, I was always fascinated with the fact that people could speak a different language. And because of the proximity to the French islands of saint pierre et uh I had traveled there and so was quite interested in learning a second language. Um, so, uh, so what did you do after high school? I actually went to Memorial University uh, without a real idea as to what I wanted to do, but thinking that French was a great subject, so perhaps I'd pursue a degree in French. Uh, spent a year in Trois-Rivières and a year in Strutsny and then came back and did my last year at Memorial University and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts with a major in French. That's my mind. That's my question. Right on. Um, so uh, any, I guess quite often uh, in university that's where you discover yourself, you realize what you thought you liked uh, and sometimes that changes. Uh, did that do, did that have to, did yeah. the university have any impact uh, on you in terms of changing your perspective or your uh, I, I think it did in the sense that um, I knew that I wanted to work with people. I was more clear that I really wanted to work with people. I wanted something, um, I think with an arts degree, because it's general and you touch a little bit of everything, it gave me a sense that that's what I wanted to do in life. I wanted to touch a little bit of everything. And so I guess I wanted to be a generalist, which I, without knowing what that term really meant, I wanted to be a generalist rather than a specialist. And I think the language just opened up the fact that I think I realized how much I wanted to travel. and and um, and. Uh, so sort of thought, but okay, a career with a little bit of travel and a little bit of um, uh, use of the French language. So, uh, so what would you consider to be your first official uh, job after that? My first job, uh, my real first job was with the Iron Ore Company of Canada. And I think the interesting thing of how I ended up there is that I was actually, in my last year of university, I was teaching French as a second language uh, to what I would have called grown-ups. I was about uh, 20 years old at the time. And they were all professionals in St. John's area. And one of them happened to be a recruiter for IOC, for the Iron Ore Company of Canada. And so as I was getting closer to graduation, not knowing exactly what I was going to do, I said to them, if any of you here have a job you know, that might be of interest, um, please give me a call. And uh, lo and behold, I took the summer off. And, and in September, um, the interviewer from IOC called and said, there's a job in Labrador City. And having never been there, I thought, Labrador, I think that's igloos and lots of snow. And I uh, said, oh, I don't really know. And um, he went on to describe they were looking for a second language teacher uh, okay. in the mining company to teach employees because they have a facility, we still have, of course, a facility in Satil, Quebec, and our mining operations in Labrador City. So I was offered the position to teach employees uh, French as a second language. Okay. So, and, and you, that was my first job in Labrador right. City. So how was that? What, how was that as a first experience? It was a really big transition. I grew up in St. John's, Lab City, Wabush, which is now called Labrador West, is about you know, thirteen thousand people combined. So it was very small, um, and uh, I missed family. 
and uh, the first uh, the first year or two, I, I really wasn't sure I was going to stay, but people were very friendly, so the weather really wasn't anything um, to be worried about. You know, I sort of got used to the snow and the cold fairly quickly. People were great. Uh, we always say the weather is cold, but the people were warm, so that was helpful. And um, then over time, I just became um, very interested in the work and um, really committed to sort of the company and enjoying the company, and then just grew a bigger network of friends and decided to stay. Okay. So how long did you stay in... Uh, uh, 25 Boston? years. Oh, wow. 25 years. So I, I've actually okay. spent about half my life in St. John's and about half in Labrador West. Wow. I'm uh, just curious. It must take a while just to get to Labrador West. Did, it's did a, you always fly? Uh, it's, a, it's a milk run. Um, so unfortunately, it takes about three and a half hours. The direct flight's about oh, two. Okay. Um, and when I joined first, and up until about 2000, we had a company aircraft. We had a couple of company aircrafts in, in the real good days. So we'd take the company plane, and it'd be about two hours. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't think it was always a direct flight. Okay. That's better than I thought. <laughs> um, okay, so 25 years in Mount City. What, um, so I know now, you, I mean, you work in human resources. Uh, so when was that transition, or what, what was next after your second? Uh, so I, I, jo I joined in 1980, which was actually a really volatile time for the iron ore company, uh, for the iron ore market, um, which is again where we are today in 2015. Uh, so I, the position um, was, um, was actually uh, became redundant uh, after a couple of years, and uh, I was asked if I was interested in a position in public relations in Satil. And of course, the advantage of having the French language uh, meant that I could function in French. So I relocated to Satil for a year. Uh, the iron ore industry continued to, to do down, significant downsizing, and I was laid off. So I came back to St. John's for a couple of years. My parents were still here, and I came back for a couple of years and worked with federal government. And I worked in, with Revenue Canada. But again, keeping the French uh, language, I was their uh, retention language retention coordinator. So for the employees who were bilingual, I helped them maintain their skills. And I was really interested in leadership development, so I started to sort of do some volunteer work uh, within the Taxation Centre in terms of leadership development training, just as a, a little bit of a of a side, and, um, and then the next thing I knew, I transferred back with employment and immigration to Labrador West. Uh, I had met my husband, and I wanted to go back, and I went back as a bilingual employment counselor. Did that for a couple of years, got married, had a couple of children, uh, really began to enjoy as a family the smaller community, because all the advantages yeah. of a smaller community when you're raising children are just wonderful. And uh, IOC uh, asked me in 1990 if I was interested in coming back, and I came back as the superintendent of government relations. And interestingly enough, I said, interestingly enough, my first reaction was, no, thank you. I got laid off before. The mining industry is cyclical. I want something that's more, um, you know, lifelong. At, in those days, you took a job for lifelong, unlike yeah. what most people do today. Well, especially with you know, your mom and sure, and IOC said, um, oh no, you really, you know, you really have to think about this. And uh, I went back in, I met with a number of colleagues, and I was just, it was an automatic yes. I mean, I just, I, you know, just the atmosphere within the company and the, and the, the energy and the, and the commitment uh, was a great place to work. So tell me a bit about that. That, that sounds interesting. Government so I um, primarily was responsible for provincial and municipal liaison on, on major files. It could have been anything from environment to apprenticeship, sort of quite a w wide range. Um, and I did quite a bit of travel back and forth to St. John's, was luckily able to uh, balance home and work uh, quite well because I'd often take my children on the plane and bring them home here to grandparents while I do my work. Uh, so that was an added advantage for sure. I was uh, the first uh, female superintendent hired at the company, so that was quite an honor um, uh, within IOC, and continued to use my French quite a bit uh, with my counterparts in Satil. Did that for a couple of years, and then moved in on to the leadership um, development and training side of, of, of HR, uh, design and delivery of training, really enjoyed that, got to meet a cross-section of employees worked with, at that time we co-facilitated, you could have been an hourly or a staff person, we co-facilitated a lot of training based on your strength as an individual, not your job title. So that was a lot of fun. So I might have had the vice president of operations working with me to deliver time management, or I might have had a journey personal electrician. And so that was really kind of cool because we were doing a lot of cross training, and it was more about the role models than, than the sort of formal uh, piece of, of, of the education as, as your background. Did that for a couple of years, um, and then I guess then the next move was uh, into uh, manager of HR for Labrador City and Satil, and then I had responsibility for recruiting, um, organizational effectiveness, labor negotiations, 
um, comp and benefits, so really the full HR portfolio. Did that for about, I guess about almost 10 years. And again, used my French constantly because it was back and forth between Lab City and Satil. A couple of rounds of labor negotiations, which was certainly a learning experience. United Steelworkers were, uh, are, are the union at IRC, continue to be the union at IRC. I uh, had never done labor negotiations before. So that was yeah, certainly, that was that. Uh, well, it was certainly an experience. I mean, typical IOC is to give you great um, development and training. So we were sent off to Harvard to do the training for interest-based negotiations, which was quite, a, quite an exciting opportunity. But, you know, thought we would change the world and came back and realized it isn't quite as easy as that. It was quite a challenge. Uh, we had work stoppages in, in both rounds of negotiations, but certainly a great way to learn the business, a great way to learn people and a great way to learn how to influence because there's equally as much negotiating probably um, with your management team as there is with your, with your union team in terms of what are the priorities and, and what does the business really need. Mm -hmm. So it was a very good learning experience. And is, um, was there uh, any project or, um, or portfolio case um, for your career that you deem um, to, to have been dysfunctional or just unsuccessful? Um, I guess, I don't know if there's anything in particular in terms of a particular project. I mean, I think, you know, when you go through so, so much, um, the cyclical nature of our business just means that you're continuously in a change management mode. And so I think you always look back and think, oh, you know, what could we have done differently here? How could we have perhaps uh, moved things along more quickly? But I think for the most part, it's been, it's been pretty, pretty productive. If I, I'll, I'll ask a bit differently too, like, um, what would you consider to, um, to have been one of the most difficult uh, parts of your career? Oh, certainly it would be the negotiations. Yeah. yeah, it was, you know, so I was new to negotiations. It was a wonderful opportunity given to me by a VP who was very close by to coach. Uh, my counterpart in Satil uh, was equally new to the process. We were looking to make some dramatic changes in the business. Uh, for, and I'll just give you a quick example. We were looking to take you know, a wide range of roles and compress them into some broader occupations to allow for more flexibility in the business. That was very different. We were looking to introduce what would be a performance, um, a performance assessment type of tool for hourly employees, not something that was seen quite often in the industry. Um, and you know, differentiation is very um, is very uh, different from sort of the union's mandate, if you will. So some very tough, some very tough negotiations, um, successfully completed, but very tough. And when you're in a small town in a role like that, it becomes challenging because your neighbors are oftentimes people who have to, to make it feeling to have to take sides through those periods. And so uh, yeah, so it can be it, it can be tough. And at the same time, if you understand the real business rationale for why you're doing it, it helps a little. Yeah. Now you had mentioned you were uh, the first woman to become superintendent, superintendent in, for the company, yes. the entire uh, company. Um, now speaking of women, how how absent or present were they throughout your career? And I mean, you in, were through the natural resources, so yeah, in the early days, certainly very few. Um, I would say that you know when I started back in 1980, if you sat around a table, I was likely the only female for quite a number of years, and then we had a few supervisors and. We actually had a couple of tradespeople and, and a couple of laborers quite early, but in terms of the management employees, not a lot. That has certainly changed. Uh, IOC now has about 20% females um, and rising quickly. And in the mining industry, I would say the numbers are still fairly low. I think, it's, I think the national average is somewhere around 13%, 12-13%, so certainly not near where it needs to be, uh, but it is growing quickly. Yeah. And as a, as a woman, were there ever and maybe more common earlier on, but were there any experiences or, or um, times in your career where it was, uh, it was made obvious that uh, women weren't, uh, women weren't uh, as prominent in that career, in that uh, industry or in that field? No, I have to be honest. Right yeah. from the beginning, I was quite comfortable. And um, I know that there were earlier days uh, prior to my arrival, sort of in the early 70s when women first started to come into the workforce, that they may have experienced some different things than I did. But no, I, I felt very comfortable from the beginning, and uh, to be honest with you. And, um, you know, I mean, I would say to you that certainly from time to time you run across someone who perhaps uh, thought that you should still be at home. Uh, in the house, but I don't think that's any different from today. You're still going to run into an odd person like that. But for the most part, it was really, you know, if you could do the job well, you did the job well, and really it was, uh, the gender wasn't a, a huge issue. Thank you.
Um, now, um, as uh, now now working for HR, um, would you still consider one of the biggest challenges to have been uh, the negotiations, or, or now with the new title? Is well, my, my role now is um, is actually director of communications and external relations. Ah, okay. And um, when we spoke, I was actually I did have the HR portfolio, so I'll just clarify. So I so five years ago, uh, we decided uh, in late two thousand and ten, we decided to um, open a, the office in St. John's. Uh, we were in a growth mode, and obviously uh, when you're in a growth mode, there's a lot of interaction, particularly with government. And so we decided to open this office to strengthen our relationship with the, particularly the provincial government. Great opportunity for me to move back home. Uh, my children were raised, my husband was retiring, I still going to work, so wonderful way to combine both uh, my own experience and to come back a little bit closer to my original home. And I travel back and forth now because I have municipal uh, government and community as well for Labrador West. Uh, we we opened the office and um, we were very successful, I would say to you, in the last, in so sort of 2011, 2012, in strengthening our relationships with the external stakeholders. Now we're in a very different position. Um, it's, uh, it's very tough times in the iron ore industry. Um, the price is very low. It's very competitive. We've had to make some really tough decisions in the last year. And uh, the external piece was... Um, a little less required and we needed much more focus on the internal in order to sustain the business. So I actually went back into for 2015 and um, managed to help out in both roles. So I did, did HR and did uh, the communications and external relations piece as well. And just in the last week or so I'm moving back full time into communications and external relations. Now um, working human relations in a natural resource company, are there, I mean I, you haven't necessarily worked with HR in different different industries and sectors, but uh, are there like signature challenges that come with dealing with being working HR for a natural resource? Company? Certainly, I think so. I mean, if you think about communications, first of all, the ability to communicate whatever the messaging is. You have people on machinery. You have people in plants. They're not all sitting in front of computers. They're not all easy accessible. So trying to cascade important messaging and you know business basics is, is often a challenge. And even though we have the technology, the iPads and you know and and cell phones and things, sometimes parts of the plant or parts of you know if you're operating a piece of machinery, it's not it's not practical or safe to be doing it that way. So that's one of the challenges. The fact that we operate 24/7, um, and particularly as we move into not just increased women but increased parents um, you know who, who need to be at home or who so daycare for example um, daycare for a 12-hour shift is one thing daycare for a 24-hour shift is a completely different thing so there are some unique challenges um, it is remote and uh, oftentimes we are able to recruit uh, one of you know if there are two partners we can recruit one into the business but because it's a small region and a small area the question is can the second person find that same career opportunity and so you know, in the good old days, I think companies were able to create jobs for that second person. Those good old days are long gone. And uh, so that, that's another one I think that is unique in terms of probably not just mining, but remote. And generally mining is a remote. Yeah, and they right. come together. For sure. Okay. And um, yeah, this, this would be an interesting perspective too, not necessarily as someone who's <clears throat> who worked in the labs or the, or the mills, but... but um, do you think there's a disconnect between the general population and uh, the natural resource world in Canada? I don't believe people understand the value that it brings. Uh, to, as a communication. Certainly, I, I think that I think that uh, if you, because you don't visit the mine, because they're often in remote locations, people don't get to see what the day-to-day -day jobs are, and so I think for that reason, it's it's often an over overlooked opportunity for career choices. And there's a terrific amount of automation, for example, now as well in mining. And so gone are the days when, you know, people sort of saw, you know, typically they would have pictured the underground miner with the light on the hat. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we now have autonomous trucks, for example, in some of our operations in Australia. Uh, we have, you know, certainly dr we're using drones to do satellite imaging in the mine. So it's a completely different uh, place even than when I started. But even when I did start, we had some terrific opportunities as career choices that I think would not have been known to many people who, who would not have visited a mine site. Part of the challenge over the years, and certainly as part of the CIM and some of the mining promotional work we've done, is to try and bring the mine as best we can 
two conferences. And so things like Mining Matters, which is a terrific, uh, you know, is a terrific educational tool and, and, and forum. Uh, through the, our local CIM, we try to do as many interactive um, displays as we can. So again, what we always joke about is we're bringing the mine to St. John's every fall versus bringing the miners uh, or people to the mine. Uh, and a couple of years ago, we had a promotion. Um, IOC had a promotion where we did a contest and uh, we allowed school children to apply and uh, we actually flew them up with their teacher uh, to site to get a first-hand look at the mine. Mm -hmm. Kids liked it? Loved it, absolutely loved it. I think the teacher loved it as much as the kid. I think he was, I think it was a kid in the teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're very right. I don't think most kids realize too. Like, they'll, they understand roughly that there's mining and yeah. what a miner does, but uh, the countless jobs around that. Like there's well, there's that, well, the, well, you know, if you think about, you mentioned lab, I mean, there's, there's, there's terrific, um, you know, chemists, there's chemists, and there's, there's that piece of it, there's the statistical analysis, there's, there's all your regular IT finance, all those jobs that support any kind of a business that are, you know, that are generic. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, the actual operations of the mine itself, the mine engineers, for example, the metallurgists in the plants. Um, mm -hmm. We have a full occupational health and safety group, so we have everything from a hygienist to a, you know, uh, to a, uh, yeah. Safety, safety advisors. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, what has been uh, your most important work with stakeholders? A few examples. Um, I would say uh, there's certainly been a lot of a lot of writing. One of the ones that I've certainly enjoyed is uh, worked over a number of years to um, to develop and, and uh, facilitate a women in mining forum in the province, and uh, which was held here in St. John's. We did that for five years. And we, have, we brought women from across the province in a variety of uh, occupations and had them present to school groups and groups of interest. And that grew from, I believe, the first year might have been about 100 people attend up until, uh, I think it was you know, seven or 800 the last year. So that was terrific. And we also, pr we also provided a booklet to the schools that showed career choices for women in mining along with sort of the educational requirements, the typical salary range. So again, that was a really rewarding uh, project for sure. Uh, from, a, from a women in mining perspective. From a general perspective, we have uh, in Labrador City created two uh, community forums since 2010. One we call the Community Advisory Panel, which really ha is the grassroots leaders of the community. And we work together collectively on, on things like recruiting and environment and um, you know, homelessness. And then what we found when that was up and running a number of years, we really needed a more senior group who could commit uh, kind of the funding for some of these things. So it was great to have a group who could come up with some of the ideas, but we needed the money and we needed the, the a stronger influence in terms of a higher level. So we organized a group called the Regional Task Force. And that actually is really creative in that it brings together municipal, federal, and provincial players, uh, Quebec as well, because nearby Felmont, Quebec, which is ArcelorMittal, um, have been involved, the town has been involved. And we have deputy ministers sitting on that, assistant deputy ministers. And so really it's a regional committee which uh, began together looking at growth. And as I said to you, in the last year and a half has really completely switched focus to issues like sustainability and are now looking at things like potential regionalization of services such as fire services because the whole community, the whole region, two communities, three communities, has changed significantly. <coughs> So uh, that, that has been really rewarding because it's brought together people from a whole variety of backgrounds who have a common, a common uh, vision, who developed a common vision, and are really working toward achieving it. Yeah, you just um, mentioned sustainability. It's, uh, it's something that you see not just because you used to see kind of um, companies hire from the outside uh, to deal with sustainability or, or stakeholders. Um, but now it's uh, more and more it's become a must-have for each company. De definitely. And I think the interesting thing is that we, we all learn from each other. So, you know, in this past year, it's been very difficult um, and very challenging, as I said to you. But one of the things we've drawn on more than ever is our stakeholders and asked for their support. And support might be in terms of um, financial, but the, term, but the support might also be in terms of just helping us to... To, to get others to understand you know, what, what the nature of the business is about and what the market is about. And so in other words, they're an extension, they're almost ambassadors, if, if I can say it that way, uh, to helping us you know, uh, get better understanding of, of the situation. Yeah, communication is key. 
Um, now, next question may seem loaded, but there's it's, there's no wrong answer. It just seems like a, a broad question, but really, it's it's whatever you deem important. Sure. So it's um, it's in your opinion, are there any events, um, people, inventions, disasters, anything really, um, that you you deem must be mentioned when discussing the natural resources in Canada or the natural resource history of Canada? I don't know if there's anything that comes to mind in terms of a particular event. I think, though, that what comes to mind is how far we've come from when I w began in 1980 to today. In, 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 in terms of, in, ter in terms of just in terms of the, the whole, um, the whole social, uh, you know, the social environment, the sustainability of the mine. Uh, I think that, you know, it was always very short-term thinking, um, and I think that now it's certainly it's certainly not. I think the whole safety, health, and environment. Well, I would say health, safety, environment, and communities. Um, that whole, you know, that was sort of a. You know, in the early days, safety was really the, the the one branch that we looked at. I think from a mining industry now, we you know those those four areas are covered very well by the majority of businesses, and are really deemed to be a part of your social license to operate. Mm -hmm. So they're not a nice to have. They're equally as important as the operating metrics. Mm -hmm. So when we sit around a table, and I just don't think that's unique to IOC. I think in the mining industry in Canada. When, when executives are sitting around the table, they're not just talking about production. They're talking about health, safety, environment, and communities mm -hmm. and the roles they play. So I think while I can't think of something that sort of brought us to that, I believe that a variety of events over yeah. the years have brought us to that, where that is now just part of everyday dialogue within, within the mining business. And I think that's really wonderful because it's taken us to a very much more responsible place and it's exactly where our communities want us to be. It's where our stakeholders want us to be. Our employees are just as interested in us being environmentally responsible as are the regulators, and so I think that's uh, I think that's progress. Do you think that's come from maybe a bit of everything? But do you think that's come from uh, the stakeholders? I think it's come from the stakeholders. I think it's come from awareness. I think it's yeah. come from increased education. I think the internet, while it yeah. has its good and its bad points yeah. to some degree, it, it comes from that. Uh, certainly, social media plays a role. Again, a good and a bad part sometimes, but it certainly plays a role in terms of people's expectations and people's exchange of information. So I think it's been a, it's been a healthy, a healthy uh, transition. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll just finish a few last questions. Um, this again might seem like a general one, I can split it in two. What, um, what are you proudest of in life? And I, we could say in life and also professional. Mm -hmm. professional life. Mm -hmm. Proudest in life is that for some reason when I was 21 and just starting in my career, I decided that family were number one, career was number two, real close number two, but there'd never be a question. And so I've been really lucky to have traveled uh, extensively, to have a great family and have a great career that I'm now in my 29th year and honestly I enjoyed as much as I did when I started when I was 21. That comes from having a great family, a great support, um, a great support system. It comes from having some great bosses over the years. Uh, but I think it also comes with, for whatever reason, having a real clear understanding of what you want out of life and then not, not deviating from that. So that's been really wonderful from a personal perspective. From a work perspective, I, have, um, I would like to say to you that one of my strengths is coaching. And what I, I had a great VP a number of years ago who was coaching me, who actually helped me move into the labor side when I was very hesitant to do so. It looked pretty overwhelming. And uh, he was great at, at, at helping you to stretch your boundaries. And I remember saying to him, what do you like most about your job? He was about 15 years at that point as a VP of HR. And he said, I love to watch people develop and go beyond their comfort zone. And I would say to you, uh, it's really interesting, but that is what I love about my job. And, and so I have the opportunity lots of times to help coach. I've done a lot of recruiting of junior uh, engineers and I ran the graduate program for a number of years. And so a lot of that was mentoring. And I continue to do mentoring in a variety of ways. And the most rewarding part is to actually see some of the young people develop to be very strong leaders in the organization and beyond the organization. And to then watch them go ahead and go on to, to mentor and coach others. I think that's the most rewarding part. Um, you, had, uh, you had just mentioned a while ago the CIM. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, organizations you're part of? Yes, I am. I'm currently I'm a member of CIM, but I'm actually the president of Mining NL, so the Mining Association uh, for Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, first, I want to say yes, first female president. Uh, so again, that's first. kind of that's kind of cool, uh, and I'm certainly enjoying that. It's been a tough again. It's been a tough uh, tough couple of years because uh, we have a great board and we have a great executive director. 
Um, but you know, again, it's it's a tough time to be in the mining industry. But we're continuing to pull together and continuing to move ahead as best we can. We're looking at a great innovation co uh, conference early in the new year, and that's partly to sort of say to the membership, yes, it's a tough time, um, but you know, we have to keep growing, and innovation is a key part of the success in any business going forward. So let's look at what mining can do in terms of making themselves more competitive. So we're looking forward to some top-notch speakers. Um, to do that uh, in, in early in the year. So from a mining industry and now perspective, we're, we're working on that as one of our challenges. Yeah, unlike what uh, many people say or used to say that mining is a sunset industry. There's, look, there's look, so much innovation. Uh, look, it, it's, you know, it's, it's really rewarding and interesting to see. And, um, you know, it, and, and again, I'll say to you, uh, one of, one of uh, our Australian operations actually operates a, um, a control center in Perth which really controls what's happening in the mines in some very remote areas within Australia. And we're now looking at doing something similar in Labrador West, and we've just begun our Operations Excellence Center. It's, uh, it's amazing. And I think the other the fun thing is that it's going to be uh, allow a number of employees to upskill. So there are a number of employees who have jobs that, uh, for which, um, you know, after a while they become fairly routine. And so the chance to introduce some new technology into their jobs, I think is going to be really well appreciated. Um. Last question, if you were speaking to someone uh, much younger like a student, you just said you like to, to mentor and coach, um, what would be the one important life lesson or piece of advice you would give them? Resilient. Resilient. You have to be resilient. You have to be resilient. Um, you know, what I've seen in, since 1980 to 2015 in, in IOC and within the mining industry you have to be able to roll with the punches. You have to be able to move as, as change requires. You have to, you just have to keep uh, keep adjusting. So yes, there are the good times and there are the bad times. There are good times, bad times. If you're a person who can't handle the gray or the ambiguity, which was a word I remember at one time looking at it in a, in a, a job posting and, see, and I didn't know what, really what the word meant. And I looked it up and thought, oh, I'm very good at that. So if you can't live in the gray zone, um, mining, I don't think mining is the place. If you like, uh, if you like never knowing what's going to happen the next day and, and you can roll with punches, I think mining is a great opportunity for anybody in any sort of walk of life, whether it's science, human resources, um, you know, technology. What are a few of your examples of <coughs> the grass? Well, I think, um, again, you know, we, we, we went for, through a growth period and opened this office and within two years and staffed up. And within two years, we were taking 50% of the workforce from this office and, and unfortunately making them redundant and heading into a survival mode. So that's a pretty tough, and, in, and, and you know, as a community liaison with your stakeholders, you're out, you know, investing all kinds of money in, in community groups and doing all kinds of growth, and then, you know, within within days or weeks, it seems you're turning around and going into a completely different mode. So that emotionally, that's tough for people to, to, to be able to sometimes move through. So I think I think miners are are a different breed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, always got the, the cyclical, uh, cyclical cyclical business. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add or share? No, I just think this is a wonderful project. I think, uh, I think the opportunity, I think mining is sometimes um, you know, not as out there in, in the forefront, and I think the opportunity to speak to some people who've, who've been involved in mining uh, is a great project. And uh, certainly uh, you know, across the country there's a range of experiences, and uh, within the age groups there's a range of experiences. And uh, I, I certainly uh, commend you for, uh, for the work you're doing. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you.